Um, so I'm going to switch gears, though, on everyone, and I'm going to um, go to dryland ecosystems rather than aquatic ecosystems. And, and I want to thank you for tuning into this session. I, I appreciate the time and energy um, that it takes to be on Zoom and, um, and also for you thinking about how we can remediate mine sites with forest fuel treatments that create biochar. And what I hope to, decide, to describe to you today is some real world examples of how land managers can take advantage of a waste resource and turn it into a valuable product to restore mine site vegetation and ecosystem services. And of course, none of this work would be possible without some fabulous co-authors and the help of public land agencies that have allowed us to do um, a lot of this research. And of course, you know, I have to thank the biochar industry for helping us make biochar, um, figure out what works best for um, public land applications. Um, and, you know, it's, it, you know, it takes a village to do this kind of work. So, so today I, I want to cover, um, I'm going to give you a roadmap up front. Um, you know, what are we going to think about? Um, it's the connections between how we do forest fuel treatments to uh, make our forest more um, resilient, how we value ecosystem services and biochar, <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about some challenges. But before I do that, I'm going to start with the summary in case, you know, who knows what happens with technology these days, right? So um, as you've already heard, and you'll hear again, forest restoration needs to be um, conducted in a lot of places. It's a critical need, um, but it can of, often be costly. Um, and oftentimes, um, as um, Kim mentioned, the woody biomass is burned in slash piles. And so we want to take advantage of some in-woods or small or moderate scale equipment that can bridge that gap between um, large scale production and in-woods processing that can make biochar and use near site. In many cases, um, we think that active mining operations can be targeted to help pay for the costs of making and using biochar as they begin to close out operations in an area. But the sticky wicket here is abandoned mines. They require more creative thinking about how we fund biochar, um, what tools are available to use, and, um, and how we um, use those on site. And you know, I, I believe that probably each site would require some economic analysis. And so I'm just gonna you know, barely skim over that today. But um, I think that biochar can be a source of revenue if there are carbon markets and if we properly value ecosystem services such as clean water, um, clean air, carbon sequestration, um, increase in hiking or recreation opportunities. So let's get started. Um, you've heard it before, uh, public lands are overstocked and they are less resilient to disturbance, particularly wildfires. Um, the urgent challenge of fire, invasive species, drought, climate change, insects, diseases, <laughs> you name it. Um, all of these means that on public lands, we have to rethink our approach to forest management. So this means that we have to figure out a way to work with states, tribes, communities, collaborative groups, um, all players in order to figure out how to reduce the fuels and improve forest conditions. So this is a shared stewardship approach. And it means that we co-manage our lands to reduce the risk of wildfire, insects, diseases, whatever, and um, could use this to help fund harvesting and new methods to reduce fuels. You know, of course, it's biochar production, right? So let's start at the beginning. What are the connections? I mentioned that you know we're thinning overstock forest stands to make them more resilient to fire. And if you restore organic matter in the soil, we're also making them more resilient and healthier that leads to healthier and more resilient forests. So you can see those connections. Um, what happens though, is that there are often um, an assortment of abandoned mine sites within um, our forest lands or other public lands. Um, you know, rangelands also have their share of um, abandoned mine sites. Um, we can use biochar created from these um, thinning materials to improve water quality, recreation opportunities, rural jobs, um, and mitigate climate change through improved seed. Uh, so carbon, I, I also want to mention that, um, you know, part of this work, if we can restore these non-productive um, mine lands to a place where they're producing um, first grasses and then forbs and shrubs and finally trees, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for forest restoration and um, 
you know, we can even start talking about helping to plant trees for the Trillion Tree Initiative that the government has signed on to. So what can biochar do? You know, you've heard it probably many times during this, <laughs> these presentations. Specifically though, what we're targeting for uh, mine lands is the water holding capacity, improved microbial communities, or even restoration of microbial communities that are long gone from these mine sites, um, restoring nutrients, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, on a lot of sites, it's a compaction issue and biochar is great at reducing compaction on, on many sites. Um, and then of course, it's the restoration of forest landscape and improvement of rural economies. So here you see um, this flame cap kiln from Wilson Biochar. Um, here's another opportunity. This um, You heard about this the first day. This is the um, big box kiln that Darren McAvoy talked about on Monday. So yeah, you've also heard about the opportunities to use small or moderate scale biochar production. Our goal is to make biochar locally and use locally. Um, and we can, with forest um, woody biomass, we can get a pretty consistent char that's high in carbon. Um, and the pH is usually around neutral. So on sites that um, are, have a very high pH, this biochar could be used to lower it. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm gonna talk in a little bit about some ways we can specifically target um, what's going on on individual mine sites as well. So, um, what we what we really want to talk about is how biochar can improve mine sites by changing soil properties. However, um, when we think about mine sites, um, there's as I mentioned, there's a lot of different types of mine sites that we want to think about. It's not just they're all the same, um, and we can address them all in the same way. So I want to talk about these different types of mine sites: the non-contaminated soils, the contaminated ones, and, and Pat gave an excellent example of. of some of the ways that we can address those contaminated sites. Um, some sites are just rock piles. And then we have the unconventional oil and gas drilling sites. And so, um, so I think we can um, try and think about all of those different situations as we move forward here in this talk. So non-contaminated mine tailing. So organic matter, get some of the vegetation um, started and then come back with some more later on. Um, you know, we, we have to also think about, you know, we're not gonna go right to trees. Um, building that grass and forb community encourages more organic matter production that can lead to those woody shrubs and trees. And there are hundreds of thousands of these sites on the US. You know, some of them are less than an acre, some of them are huge. And so um, I think one of the challenges is that we need to, um, you know, show where these things can work. So rock piles. <laughs> You know, we we, um, we discovered that even rocks can grow by can grow plants when you add biochar. Um, so the biochar we used on this site was from um, local feedstock. It was uh, uh, mixed conifer, um, and we just spread it on top of the rocks, not really knowing what would happen. And um, we seeded half of this plot, and you can see in this picture that um, we actually got some you know native species to grow. Um, this was one year after. I mean, you know, it's it's not a lot of plants, but we, we actually have, um, you know, some native plants coming in on these rock piles. The biochar works its way into the cracks between the rocks and, you know, begins to serve as a medium for growing um, plants. And, and so um, contaminated mine soils are probably the need the most attention. And um, you know, we have the ability to tune the biochar that we use on these sites to really target the pH, the contaminants, the plant species that we want to grow. Um, this design or biochar concept isn't something that we can do um, in woods and with moderate scale production. I, I think um, this is something that needs to be um, thought about a, a little bit more thoroughly than just, um, you know, we can go into the site and remediate it with whatever biochar. In some cases, that's probably true, but um, I think when it comes to contaminated mine soils, um, there's a lot more research and testing that needs to be done to be able to target those places um, and those plants that will do best to be able to first get vegetation established. And then once the soil is remediated, then we can start to think about, um, okay, so now what other kinds of plants can we add? Or um, is this site only going to be a place where grasses grow? 
um, should this site be fenced in order to keep um, cattle or wildlife away so that we're not, um, you know, moving contaminants up through the food chain. Um, unconventional gas and oil wells, are, are, you know, there's a huge infrastructure associated with these. And I think um, one of the best places that biochar can be useful is to remediate the soil compaction that's associated with these abandoned structures. Um, also the loss of vegetation. Um, remediating these sites means that we can address habitat fragmentation and water and air pollution that comes from, um, you know, blowing dust or um, water pollution from these abandoned mine sites. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, abandoned wellheads that are inactive or abandoned. And, um, you know, I think these are places that we can target. Um, you know, I, I highlight this study by Neller and others um, from this year where they talked about um, how reclamation can restore ecosystem services and generate millions of dollars annually for states or counties. And um, a lot of that comes from a restoration of um, recreational activities, um, but also, you know, how you value the carbon that's sequestered below ground, um, you know, and, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities that we still need to explore on a lot of these um, different mine sites. So I, I highlight the Forest Service strategy because I work for the Forest Service and you know, it's easy to talk about this. Um, but our, our strategy for mine site and biochar um, has, has been, or we're moving towards a place where we want to use these waste residues to create this higher value product that we could use locally. Um, we reduce those transportation costs. Um, it gives us a place where we can um, you know, use this material without impacting the soil through slash pile burning. Um, and, um, you know, Jim Archuleta has pointed out several times that um, it's just a, a matter of organic matter redistribution. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of it on forest sites. We need some on these abandoned sites that have no vegetation. It could also be used on agricultural lands. Um, you know, we might think about using it on um, near stream sides to um, get vegetation to shade streams. You know, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for using biochar in a local um, situation. And is it profitable? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, that's that's the big question. Um, you know, I think if we're talking about locally made moderate scale production, some of this work can be done as part of the forest restoration activity. Part of it can be done, as I mentioned before, with um, having people who are um, you know, the mine owners who are thinking about restoration ahead of time or are under pressure from people like the Forest Service to restore these lands to some level of productivity. Um, and I think that, um, you know, wherever we do this, I think the ecosystem benefits probably outweigh a lot of the costs that are involved. And so, um, you know, how to make this pay? You know, there are expenses, um, waste wood disposal to reduce wildfire risk also is a cost. Um, and, you know, I, I guess we have to figure out where that highest value lies. Um, but, you know, I'm still going to stress that, um, you know, there's value added with we can um, you know, change soil pH, add nutrients, um, maybe compost this material so that it's a better sorbent or a better um, nutrient um, exchange sites. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits that can be accrued um, with less erosion, more soil cover, as I mentioned, stream shading. And, you know, I think, um, you know, part of this activity means that we have to take advantage of those programs that can allow landowners to see some benefits. So if it's a mine owner, maybe it's carbon credits. Um, if it's, um, you know, abandoned land on forest service or other public lands, I, I think those are the places where we just need to talk about improved soil health and, and how do you value that. So, um, you know, in this site, you know, really this material has no value, right? This woody feedstock that's been left over from harvest operations, you know, we say it's free, but it doesn't really mean that there's no cost, right? So we have to, um, you know, figure out how, where those processing costs are, if there's um, handling or delivery costs. Um, and, you know, that might mean that, um, you know, these mobile inwoods processing are able to take advantage of you know, some of the logistics that, um, we're, you know, we're making it on site and, you know, not shipping it someplace else. I think there's also opportunity with some of these moderate scale production um, um, facilities that we can take advantage of heat and power or combined heat and power. 
um, you know, so maybe it's to, um, you know, maybe it's a gasifier, a mobile gasifier to produce um, uh, fuel, and you could use that on trucks to move the product within the woods. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, heat for a local greenhouse. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunities that we just need to think outside the box on some of these things. And then um, there are a lot of direct benefits from the biochar production, you know, such as reduced wildfire risk, um, the restored landscape should be valuable to both local and non-local communities um, as we bring in more tourists because now this land is productive and um, we have wildlife in the area now. Um, could be just increased revenues from hikers, hunters, fish people, um, photographers, bird watchers, all of those things come when we start to change how these ecosystems, um, you know, interact with things like erosion and water quality and we finally have some vegetation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the key though is that we have to build these reclamation partnerships. And, you know, there's nothing better in my opinion than standing out on a site, waving your arms and talking about what works and what doesn't work with all of the stakeholders. Um, and I think this is the key piece to acceptance. We have to educate, um, you know, the local community to get them to accept even the harvest operations sometimes, but also, um, you know, how we, how and where we put the biochar back out and what our goals are for what that site might look like. And, you know, from a public lands perspective, the stewardship contracting might be a mechanism that can benefit all of those people in the partnership. So I, I want to close out by saying, um, yep, forest restoration is increasing and it will continue to increase. Um, and, um, and we need to take advantage of those fuels that are produced um, when we um, do those thinning operations. And we can take advantage of those by using it for abandoned mine site reclamation. Um, you know, and like I mentioned, there's hurdles to overcome. Uh, it's the contracting piece, it's the planning piece, um, it's the, you know, figuring out what type of biochar do you have for specific site conditions, markets for the excess biochar that's produced maybe. Um, but I think, you know, those things are evolving. We just need to, you know, keep our thinking caps on when we start thinking about that. And I think, um, you know, part of the big benefit is that we can improve local economies, both directly by employing people and indirectly by those, you know, tourists that might come in and use these sites. And so with that, I hope you can still hear me <laughs> um, and we'll answer questions at the end. Thank you so much.